We'll start recording now then. Okay, welcome back to class everyone. And this is going to be lecture number nine in our series in the book of Acts. This is like family history, right? The, the household of faith in the New Testament dispensation was born on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. And that's our family history. That's when our family was born. And we're tracking the origin and early history of the family, the household of faith. And where we ended up last week, we were in Acts, the third chapter, Acts 3. And we saw the original disciples, or two of the original disciples, the apostles, Peter and John. Peter and John had gone up to the temple to pray. And there they met a man who was... uh, Paralyzed, He was lame, he couldn't walk, and he sat there, I guess his friends, family, whoever, they kind of plunked him down there at the temple gate, and he would beg. And last week we saw that Peter and John uh, approached that man, and Peter said, silver and gold, I have none, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. And that guy got up and walked, he was jumping and leaping and praising God, a complete and total restoration miracle. And uh, that, w- that factored largely in our message last week because you, you remember that after this miracle took place, enormous crowds of people clustered around Peter and John and that healed man. Everyone was amazed at what had happened. And Peter gave a sermon to all those people. He said, now I have your attention. I'm going to give you a sermon And I'm going to explain what has just happened here. And so uh, Peter said, basically, if I could distill the sermon down, this is the work of King Jesus. He is now at the right hand of God the Father. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. I'm sort of paraphrasing, but this is the sense of the passage. These are things that Jesus has said already. It's the resurrected Christ who's responsible for this man and his perfect soundness. And then uh, Peter said something very important, and we spent time on it, verse 21. Look at 321, whom, that's Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Uh, This was, I believe, uh, a legitimate reoffer of the kingdom. See, if you even backed up to verse 19, Repent, says Peter in verse 19, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. And then we get the promise of restoration. That's a promise of the kingdom. All those kingdom promises in the Bible, Old and New Testament, uh, refer us to a time in the future when Jesus reigns and rules over the planet. You can expect Eden-like conditions once again on planet Earth. So animals don't hurt and destroy anymore. All the creatures are peaceful vegetarians. Uh, There'll be abundant food in the earth. No demons harassing people and so on. Uh, Those are Eden-like conditions. And that's what the Bible says you can expect when Jesus returns. That is uh, complete and total restoration. And uh, where we left off, I said we we could actually have a little uh, counterfactual thought experiment. We could say... What if Israel had accepted Christ the first time when he came? What would happen? Well, they would receive him as king, and then the Romans would get upset, and they would crucify him like they did other messiahs. And, of course, he would uh, rise from the dead, and he would rescue his people, just like the Bible says he will do at the end of this age. So I just take this to be uh, a legitimate offer. Uh, if, If those Jews, if national ethnic Israel had received Peter's message here as a nation and received Christ, I believe he would have returned right there. And of course, uh, the Romans, the Gentiles, would have stood against Israel at that time, but Jesus would have rescued them and established his kingdom early. Again, just like uh, the Bible tells us he will do in places like Revelation 19, for example. Okay? So if we could just continue on here. John, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Are you talking about the millennial kingdom or after the final judgment? Uh, I'm talking about the millennial kingdom. So when you said there's going to be no demons, there will be people still sinning. But no demons. But no demons. But no demons. 
Say, we went through that. We went through a Bible cosmology course. We call it the Five Worlds of Bible right. History Science. It's all online. You can part, you know, partake. But uh, I think you might have been busy with your newlywed over there. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> but it does say that. Um, I was here. Yeah. <laughs> the scripture is pretty clear that uh, when Jesus returns, he will consign uh, Satan, the beast, the false prophet. And wicked, unclean spirits, they all go down into that, into that bottomless pit. Right. Yeah. And that's why at the end of the millennium, uh, Jesus will open the pit. He'll release Satan to deceive right. the nations once more. Yeah, for but for a thousand years, uh, Satan is conspicuous for his absence. And, uh, and people are not going to blame it on him anymore. Unregenerate man will, even during the kingdom age, hate Jesus in his heart. Yep. He will. And many of these people, most of them, will go through the motions outwardly. They'll appear to be believers. But the second Satan is released, and he wants to gather an army, he'll have it. He'll have it. (laughs) Uh, I think that's before the second coming, the 200 million. I think, think, read it again, it's 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 a, a number you can't count. It's like the sand of the seashore at the end of the millennium. Hey? Probably more. Yeah. Val, you had a comment yeah, there. Yeah, right? I, I just, uh, I don't mean to oppose you, but I think that um, it wouldn't, uh, uh, the millennium would have started now because there are things in Isaiah and Ezekiel, the mm-hmm. prophets that have to be, uh, that have to still be accomplished before, mm-hmm. before it, the, all these events can happen. Yeah, these are just fun little counterfactual thought experiments that we're doing. I just wanted to say that um, the offer was legitimate. Peter wasn't playing games with them. He said, receive him now, and, and he, heaven won't keep him any longer. You, you will re- he says, you will receive times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. I think that the offer was real. But if, now here's the thing. God knew that if these people are going to accept or reject, if they would have accepted, then the prophecies in the Old Testament would have been different. You see, this is God. Exactly. exactly. They weren't, so. Right, correct. This is God's sovereignty and human free will and responsibility. And um, we can, how far can we go down that road before we just admit we can't go too far, <laughs> before we just can't figure all this out? But anyway, I'm just simply saying it looks like Peter was um, being quite legitimate there with that offer. Now, notice here in verse 22, we have more appeals to prophecy. A constant, constant theme in the, Old, or in the New Testament, rather. A constant theme in the New Testament. In fact, it's a constant theme in the writings of the early church fathers, too, constantly referring to the Old Testament. I was very shocked. Years ago, when I took it upon myself to really study the anti-Nicene fathers, to really know what those guys were saying and teaching and believing, I was quite shocked and quite pleased, actually, that they spent so much time in the Old Testament. And central to their teaching was God the Creator. God is the creator of this world. He has the supreme right to rule, to be believed and obeyed. And um, they're just following in the footsteps of the original apostles. Peter, in verse 22, points us to perhaps the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, Moses. Look at verse 22. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And um, so Peter wants to say, Moses, 1,400 years before Jesus, was writing about the Lord Jesus. And a couple times in the Bible, we're going to be introduced to this, that Moses wrote about Jesus. Jesus himself would say that in the days of his earthly ministry. Remember John 5? He said, if you believed Moses, you believe me because he wrote about me. And uh, Jesus would go on in John 5 as well, and he would say that uh, all the scriptures in John 5, 39, all the scriptures testify about me from beginning to end, you know? And that's, uh, that's a spectacular thing to learn as a new Christian. I remember becoming a, becoming a Christian and being introduced to the Bible and discovering all these Old Testament prophecies concerning Jesus. Some are out, outright predictive prophecies like this one, From Deuteronomy 18, some are shadow and type, Uh, some are simply sort of thematic, but they're there, and they all speak to Jesus, the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, If you drop down to um, 
verse 24. Yes, says Peter, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold of these days. Uh, he actually, in verse 25, he refers us to Abraham. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made to our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Uh, I want you to think about this. Uh, he says that the promise to Abraham was that in him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. In fact, in his seed, and Paul in Galatians 3 will expound upon that, won't he? He'll, Paul will make a big deal about that. He'll say, notice, notice, the prophecy or the promise was not to your seeds, plural, as of many, but in your seed, one, Jesus Christ. See? And um, I mean, you talk about... Uh, accuracy, precision in handling the word of God. Paul would actually make a big case on whether a word is plural or singular there. But that's the, the promise here to Abraham. In your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And this is, this is speaking to us of the gospel. In Jesus, all the families of the earth will be blessed. The gospel is for everyone, for all the sons of Adam. And, uh, but notice, to Israel first, verse 26, for to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you, every one of you. That is a constant theme in the Bible as well. But I do want you to notice something here. Uh, it says in verse six, uh, 26, to you first, now get the picture here, guys. In chapter 3, he's got an ocean of people all standing around him, because he just healed that crippled man. That's, he's still at the temple here, right? And all these people are amazed at the miracle. They're all clustered around, looking at Peter and listening to him as he preaches. And then he says something. He says, to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Is this for everybody? Is this for the entire crowd? It kind of sounds like it. Jesus has come to turn every last one of you away from his iniquities. Now, if you, if you jumped over to chapter 4 and verse 4, you would see that not everyone believed. Many did, but not everybody. And I just take this as another clue that Jesus really did come to save everyone. He has made everybody savable. That's how I read the scriptures. And this is... This is controversial. That's okay. But as I understand the scriptures, Jesus came to make everybody savable. See? <laughs> he came to turn everybody away from their sins. That means everybody's been enabled. But whether or not you do that, that's on you. But I do take it to mean that um, everybody is savable because of what Jesus did. Uh, observe something, though, here. Uh, Peter, in this passage and in others like it, uh, he says things in his speech recorded here that map on very nicely to things he writes in his epistles. Uh, you know, we hear Bible, liberal Bible scholars, they want to tell us that the book of Acts and the, uh, the general epistles of Peter and so on, they weren't really, of course, written by Peter. Those are written by some anonymous person, then his name got slapped on there to give it some authority. We hear that all the time. People say things like that. And yet, here you read this speech... And you compare it to the things that Peter has written in those epistles, at least the epistles attributed to Peter, and you say, this surely sounds like the same person <laughs> talking. Uh, just a couple things here. In verse 14, back in 314, he told the crowds, you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. In 1 Peter 3.18, Jesus uh, is referred to by Peter as the just one. He, he tells his readers, uh, God has offered him up the just for the unjust. Remember that? 1 Peter 3.18. Uh, and then this constant referring to the Old Testament prophets in verse 18, 3.18, Acts 3.18. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled 
And again, down in verse 24, all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold of these days. And that, that sounds a lot like Peter. If I just quickly go to 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, Peter says here, speaking of our salvation, it's really difficult to know where to jump into the text because 1 Peter 1 is so beautiful. But if I just uh, put in uh, verse uh, 10... 1 Peter 1.10, speaking of our salvation, he says, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which you now have been, which now have been reported to you, through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. That kind of sounds like Peter. You know, he's, his mind is on those Old Testament prophets. They were writing about the things that these New Testament saints were now experiencing. See, and um, I think that's just another internal evidence that the Bible is exactly what it claims to be. Okay, make sense to everyone? Amen. And track that, you know, as you, as you read First and Second Peter, think about the Gospels. Or, as, or do it the other way, as you read the Gospels, watch Peter, think about what he's hearing, what he's experiencing, and then uh, think about his epistles. It's, you, you can find uh, scores of parallels there. You know, as you read the epistles, you can go, oh, I know where you got that, Peter. I, there, you were standing right there in that gospel account, and you heard Jesus say that. That's why you put it here, and so on. And, and we're going to catch on uh, to some of those things as we traffic, even through the book of Acts. But all those things are very faith-affirming to me as I read the scriptures. Well, I do want to say a word here before we get done with chapter 3 on ignorance and culpability. Two uh, in, <laughs> important things to think about. Ignorance and culpability. Uh, Peter says um, in verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his, holy, by all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus, thus fulfilled. So in verse 17, uh, the idea is the people that crucified Jesus didn't know what they were doing. They really didn't know that this was the Christ. They did not know that they were crucifying the Son of God. It was hidden from them. They, they didn't know. Paul would tell us in uh, 1 Corinthians and the third chapter, he, he would actually say, these people that killed Jesus or orchestrated this judicial murder, he says, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They honestly did not know. Uh, it, Paul actually goes on in 1 Peter uh, no, First Timothy, rather. Paul tells us in First Timothy and the first chapter, beginning verse 12, Paul said uh, he was, before his conversion, an evil man and a blasphemer. Uh, he persecuted the household of faith, and, uh, but God uh, entrusted minist the ministry to him. God reached him, changed him, and counted him faithful and put him into the ministry. And Paul tells us in those verses, though, he says, he says, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in disbelief. I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in disbelief or in unbelief. So there's a little something here. Um, even when Jesus was being crucified in Luke 23, we're told that he prayed to his father while they were killing him. I mean, you could just stop and think about that all night, couldn't you? While the man is being executed, an innocent man, he prayed to his father for his murderers. He said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. They know not what they do. They don't know. Now, Jesus would never have prayed a prayer like that um, if real ignorance doesn't count for something. It would be a useless prayer if... Um, if God's just going to judge everybody the same, whether you know or whether you don't know. You see? There's a little relationship here between real ignorance and culpability. 
it's clear to us that the truth about Jesus was really unknown to these people who engineered that, that murder and who carried it out. So it looks, it looks to be that in the scriptures, a measure of grace and we'll say a measure of grace is shown to people and forgiveness is offered uh, when you really don't know. Okay. But at the same time, now let's get the other side of this coin here. Can we please? Let's put balance to it. <laughs> at the same time, the ignorance itself can be uh, something that makes you culpable. You see, if, if you didn't know any better, God will offer a measure of grace to you and he'll offer forgiveness. But what if you don't know, and, but you should have known? You could have and should have. The ignorance itself makes you responsible and culpable, see? And uh, an example of that would be Luke 19, where Jesus was uh, really troubled as he thought about Jerusalem and what was about to befall Jerusalem. And he said, uh, Jerusalem, you, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. He, he held them accountable for not knowing um, that, that the Son of God had, had arrived, that the Messiah was here. They should have known. They could have consulted their prophet Daniel. They could have figured it out. We can do that today. We can do that. You know, if you take the prophecies of Daniel 9, seriously, Daniel tells us when Messiah is going to come. And Jesus wrote into Jerusalem exactly when Daniel said that was going to happen. Any serious student of the scriptures should have recognized the time of their visitation. They didn't. So Jesus held them accountable for that. Okay? Does that make sense to everyone here? Their visitation could have and should have been known, and so therefore they were culpable for their ignorance. And, and that's, a, that's a funny sort of relationship here. Jesus says in John 15 uh, regarding the Pharisees, you know, he said, if I had not come to them, they would not have any sin. They wouldn't know any better. But I've come, and I've talked to them. They claim to see, therefore uh, they will be judged. They're guilty. You claim to know, you claim to be able to judge rightly, okay, now you're accountable. You're at least accountable to the standard that you've set, and nobody lives up even to their own standard. I mean, the final word on the matter, I think, is John 3.19. This is the final word on this. Jesus says, this is the condemnation. Here it is. This is why people go to hell. Ready? Because they love darkness rather than light. Yeah. Light has come, and they hated the light. They love the darkness rather than the light. And I think uh, the net teaching of all this is simply... God is going to hold people accountable in accordance with whatever truth confronted them and they knew it to be true. God doesn't judge you to be responsible to truths you don't know. He, but he is going to judge you on how responsible you were with the truths you did receive. And that's Mark 4. There's other, many places in the Bible. Okay. Does everyone understand what I'm saying here? And this is helpful because people always ask, well, what, what happens to people who live off in some faraway country, out in the desert someplace or in a jungle somewhere, and they don't have a Bible, and they, they never even heard the name Jesus, uh, how can they be saved? And my answer to that is, everybody but everybody has received a measure of truth from God. Okay? Uh, Paul will tell us that in Romans 1 and 2. Everybody but everybody looks at the created order. They see the signature of the creator on that created order. And they know it's his signature because he's revealed himself immediately to the heart of everybody. That's Romans 1, verses 18 to 20. Romans 2, 14 and 15. They even know what his moral law contains, at least in rough. Romans 2, what? Uh, 14 and 15. So people know there's a God. They know he created they know that he's a moral lawgiver. He's placed some obligations on us. And nobody's living up to those obligations. People know that. Now, what are you going to do with this? The entire world knows it. What do you do? My understanding as I consult the scriptures is this. And as I consult anthropology, would be something like this. If you have a people group off there in the jungle someplace, and they're looking at creation and conscience, and they say... Sincerely, mind you, sincerely, they say, we want to know this God. Who is he and what does he want? We sincerely want to know. My understanding is they'll get the gospel. Some missionary is going to find them. And I have books in my library filled with accounts like that, 
where people respond affirmatively to the truths that God has reached them with, and therefore God gives them more truth. But God is under no moral obligation to give people the greater light of the gospel if they're going to trample underfoot, ignore, suppress, deny the lesser lights of creation and conscience. That would only add to their condemnation. Isn't that true? If you have people who know that God exists because he's revealed himself in their hearts and they deny and suppress that in their entire life, why should God bring the gospel to them? Their punishment in hell would be even worse. Right? Don't we have scriptures that tell us that there is gradation in hell? There's levels, yeah. He told the Pharisees, uh, here's your list of your crimes against humanity and against God. Therefore, you will receive the greater damnation. I think that's Matthew 23. The greater damnation. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't want to confuse anybody here, but I do think that God is what we, I think we can all reasonably agree uh, is fair. God is fair. He doesn't judge you because of what you don't know. He judges you on how you respond to the things you do know. How, how do you conduct yourself? Um, and as I said before, your, some ignorance is culpable. Makes you, some ignorance does make you culpable. You could have and should have known better. And that get, that'll put you in trouble, right? Is everyone still with me? Did I thoroughly confuse everybody? You're okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Very quickly with our remaining couple minutes here. Let's go into chapter 4. And I just want to read the first four verses. And this is really, really nice. This is something very uplifting. And it's a little bit comical too, actually. <laughs> Acts 4. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Let's just stop there. What a, what a powerful account here. This is still uh, on the heels of that miraculous healing where that, that crippled man was miraculously restored, and the crowds came and they heard that powerful sermon. Well, the priestly, priestly class came and apprehended uh, Peter and John and put them in prison. They were really upset with the message. Um, but think about the irony here. They, let's lock these guys away because we don't want this thing to spread. You know, they, they didn't like this at all. And yet, um, in this one incident, Peter and John made 2,000 more converts. <laughs> it's like, too late, guys. <laughs> it's a little too late. You know, you put them in jail, but... Um, Maybe you should have done that a little early, earlier. <laughs> Meanwhile, the church is growing right under their noses. Exactly. And, and this is one of the things, you know, um, who's ever heard of D. James Kennedy before? Fort Lauderdale, D. James Kennedy. I rather like him. He's gone now to be with the Lord. But years ago, I listened to a sermon that he gave called Why I Believe in the Resurrection. And um, he talked about the explosive growth of the church. Uh, right at the beginning of, of Christian history. And he said, we don't have just to account for the rapid expansion without violence or threats, mind you, but we do also have to account for the paralysis of Christ's enemies. Just like you said, Peter, this thing is growing like wildfire right under their noses. They can do nothing about it. And this is quite different from other would-be Messiah movements, isn't it? Remember Thutis? And Judas, we're going to hear about those guys in chapter 5. Uh, these were people who started their own Messiah movements, and the government squashed them. And when you squash a Messiah, you squash the movement. And all of a sudden, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, shows up. He's another Messiah, another guy that Rome kills, and the movement continues. In fact, unstoppable. And... Um, we want to say there must be something different about him and the movement uh, that he's responsible for. And, uh, but I think it's quite comical. They, they, it's right under their nose. They are paralyzed, can do absolutely nothing about it. And we want to keep reading in the next lecture um, about this confrontation that takes place between Peter and John and the priestly class there in the temple. It is quite something to think about, and that'll be our next lecture. But 
before we close here, are there any questions or comments about anything that we just looked at? Any guys? Go ahead there, Peter. I thought there was a really good classic example in the, in the gospel about what we were talking about, the ignorance that he didn't have been. Right. And Jesus confronts the Pharisees and he says, you pride yourself in knowing the scripture and yet you don't see me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, and especially since they recognized the supernatural element to his ministry, so much so that in uh, Matthew 12, they started to attribute the miracles of Jesus to Satan. And even to this day, the, the Jewish Talmud uh, does regard Jesus as a sorcerer. So the supernatural element has always uh, been a part of his ministry. People have always recognized that. And so again, the ignorance as to his true identity is really unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Wasn't there a really good example of culpability in the story Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus? And the rich man wanted to come back after he died and warned his brothers and Jesus said they got the prophet. Yeah, that's that's a good one too, Lois. I think they have what they have what's sufficient. They do have what's sufficient. That's a good that's Luke sixteen. Very good, Lois. Thank you. Did you have a comment there, Aileen? <laughs> oh, okay. You're thinking about the rich man and Lazarus. Right? The common, <clears throat> common is today's rabbis were actually they're confronted with scripture today, and the source is when uh, uh, a pastor approaches them and says, "Well, you you should have known from Daniel." They're saying, "Give me a better source than Daniel." That's their oh wow, yeah. serious, serious. Yeah, lots oh, wow. of high-ranking rabbis are saying that. Give yeah. me a better source than Daniel. They're just ignorantly <sighs> like. Yeah. Well, you see, now that's incredible, isn't it? Because um, they might, I, w- I would think chances are they would regard Ezekiel as a more important and impressive prophet than Daniel, perhaps. And yet Ezekiel twice commends Daniel. Mm-hmm. Isn't it Noah, Job, and Daniel? Three men special in the plans and purposes of God. So if Ezekiel recognizes the importance of Daniel, perhaps the rabbis should too. I mean, that just sounds like common sense. <laughs> If there's any rabbis listening, <laughs> go back and read Daniel. Twelve solid chapters. Yeah. Yeah, Dan? Uh, just, uh, just a refresher. Uh, was it uh, uh, Acts 3.18 that said that the Jews were ignorant of the scripture? Or was that... Uh, or was Acts 3.18 and then 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. But you're going to find lots of examples like that. Yeah, I just threw that out as a little example there. Oh. In 1 Peter 3.18... That corresponds to Acts 3.14, where he refers to Christ as the just, the just one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we take a little break here, and uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes, and we'll get into Acts, the fourth chapter. Oops.